Hey guys, welcome to another Friday video. We are back with the LGA 2011 platform and today we're looking at a 12 core 24 thread processor that I bought for 80 US dollars from AliExpress. As always, this video is quite packed with information. We will of course check out the processor. We've got some benchmarks and some games running, but there's more to it. The 2011 platform is quite interesting. You can buy a used mainboard, but they sell for quite a premium. So what you can do is go to AliExpress and buy a new Chinese 2011 mainboard, but there are some little quirks to be aware of. RAM is also cheap, so we're gonna work with some registered ECC memory and we're also checking out a one terabyte SSD that got sent to our channel. So here we have the CPU, it's an Intel Xeon E5 2651V2, which is from the Ivy Bridge generation, built on a 22 nanometer process. So it's actually quite energy efficient. It has 12 cores, 24 threads. The clock speed is running at only 1.8 gigahertz. So we will have a look how that affects performance in games. In games, it will boost up to two gigahertz. Basically, it will run at two gigahertz uh, locked, but every now and then a single thread will run at 2.1 gigahertz. We've got three megabytes of level two and a whopping 30 megabytes of level three cache. There's a DDR3 quad channel memory controller running at 1600 megahertz. And I bought this for 80 US dollars from AliExpress. Here we have a typical LGA 2011 mainboard that you can get from places such as AliExpress. This one is the Kleiser and yeah, quite attractive uh, layout with black and green color scheme going on. We got uh, PC Express, there's a 4X and two 16X and a 1X and they all work at full speed. We've got an M.2 slot, which also all works at full speed. The M.2 SSD that we're using in this video runs at almost four gigabytes per second, so very impressive performance. We have quad channel memory, so very high memory bandwidth. The layout with all the power connectors is also fairly decent. We're getting one SATA 3, so only a single one. The other five SATA ports are only SATA 2, so that's something to be aware of. There's a post LED speaker built in, the usual front panel connectors, uh, front USB 3 and front USB 2. There's also um, in the back, let's have a look at all the ports. So we've got six USB 2, two USB 3, gigabit ethernet, audio, and also two PS2 ports. So you're looking at around 80 US dollars for such a main board, um, not the cheapest price. And we will later at the end of the video definitely uh, talk about the value and if it's worth investing in such a platform. It is an old platform now. There are very limited upgrade options. Um, but yeah, we will talk about that later in the video. Memory prices for LGA 2011 are really good. We can use server grade memory, uh, specifically registered ECC memory. And for around 60 US dollars, you get a 32 gigabyte RAM kit, which we are using. This one is rated at 1866, but the CPU tops out at 1600 megahertz. So that's what we're using in this video. Now, DDR4 RAM prices have come down and are pretty decent. Still DDR3, especially registered ECC memory, is still a little bit cheaper, but yeah, once again, we will talk about the value at the end of the video. Once again, we're using a Radeon RX 580 with eight gigabytes of VRAM for all our testing. And we're testing all the games at 720p. I do that because this video card at 1080p will bottleneck the system and we want to test the processor and the system and not do a graphics card review. So just keep that in mind when we uh, talk about game performance later on. And HIK Vision was kindly enough to send us a one terabyte M.2 NVMe PCI Express SSD. And yeah, the performance is terrific. Um, it's got DRAM and it's got a controller from uh, Fission. And yeah, works really well. It does even have RGB. Not really my taste, but I know a lot of you guys like that. For the processor cooler, I'm using a deep cool Gamma Archer. This one is rated at around 90 watts and I couldn't find a TDP rating for the processor, but this cooler was perfectly sufficient. The mainboard comes with one of these 
AMD fan adapters. So this screws directly on the LGA 2011 socket and it's got the usual mounting hooks for AMD coolers and then you just mount the deep cool gamma archer without any issues. Like in all the previous videos, we're using a deep cool 650 watt modular power supply and I've got some power consumption figures. So sitting at the desktop and being idle, we're getting 59 watts. That's the entire machine with the video card, the RAM and everything else. And running Cinebench R20, the power consumption goes up to 122 watts. So that's actually pretty decent. Now let's have a look at some benchmarks. So in Cinebench R15, this is the older benchmark, we're getting 1039. In Cinebench R20, which is the current version, we're getting 2202. I also ran the Blender benchmark. That one runs for, yeah, 32 minutes and 30 seconds. And then we have uh, Firestrike, we're getting an overall score of 10,958 with a graphics score of 14,966 and a physics score of 10,511. And now we're gonna have a look at some games and this is where things get really interesting. You can see all the threads on the screen and yeah, it fills the entire screen, all 24 threads. And the question is, is the two gigahertz clock speed enough? And if not, can the additional cores, can they make up for any weakness? So first up we have Doom. It's, this is a, yeah, a little bit of an older game using the Vulkan API. And this game runs silky smooth, well over 100 FPS. For some reason the MSI Afterburner overlay wouldn't work with Doom uh, in this build. Usually it works, but maybe it's a new Radeon driver that broke something, I'm not sure. So I had to use the built-in overlay and yeah we're getting well over 100 fps and very nice performance next up we have project cars 2 this is the demo version there are three different tracks that you can try um, details set to high uh, with custom settings and of course running at 720p to make sure the video card is not the bottleneck there are two tracks that are tested the first one is a formula one track this one runs well with well over 60 fps the second track is more demanding we have a uh, weather simulation going on with rain and here the machine struggles to uh, hold 60 fps so we can we can see the weakness in the clock speed in this game and the next game we have is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Seems to be doing a really good job at utilizing all the cores. We're running once again high details and 720p. And even in the more demanding areas of the demo version, we're getting solid performance. Strange Brigade is another really well optimized game for uh, low clocked processors. Uses the Vulkan API and yeah, solid performance over 100 FPS runs at 720p with high details. So that's how it should be done. Uh, decent optimization, taking advantage of uh, cores and not really uh, having the need for high clock speed. Hitman 2 is the next game and this is really interesting. I tested two different missions. The first one is called a night call mission and this one runs, yeah, well, over 60 FPS, so really good experience. But then I tried the mission called the finish line and here we have a lot of IPCs running around and here the performance really suffers. Well, even dipping below 30 FPS, which is unexpected for uh, yeah, fairly modern machines still to this day. But yeah, this is a game that really needs high clock speed and fast cores rather than having lots of slow cores. But does it run crisis? Well, not really. It actually struggles at times. We're getting less than 30 FPS, which is, yeah, unexpected a little bit. I understand that the clock speed is only two gigahertz, but this is an ancient game and yeah, it's really not optimized at all. So for this game, you need like a four gigahertz processor to hit the 60 FPS most of the time. And we have one more interesting test and that is hyperthreading on versus off. So I ran the built-in benchmark of Shadow of the Tomb Raider and look at that with hyperthreading enabled and having 24 threads, we're getting an average score of 71 FPS. So that's at 720p with high details. But then I went into the BIOS, disabled hyperthreading, and the score improved to 77 FPS. So in this situation, uh, having so many cores, you might as well just turn hyperthreading off. We have 12 proper cores, and 
that's heaps. So yeah, I haven't tested any other games, but very likely you will run into similar situation with other games. On the flip side, if you're doing content creation, video encoding, 3D rendering, then the hyperthreading will definitely make a difference. And now we're gonna talk about value and prices. So we're looking at $80 for the CPU, $80 for the main board, and $60 for the RAM. And the performance, uh, it's a mixed bag. Some games that are well optimized and take advantage of multiple cores or use the Vulkan API, they run really well, but a lot of games still want uh, fast cores. And here is the main weakness of this processor. At only two gigahertz, um, it just doesn't do a good job with many titles. So looking at the prices for $80, you can definitely get an AIM4 motherboard for Ryzen processors. Looking at the CPU, also for $80, you can get the Ryzen 1600 with six cores and 12 threads. With the RAM, this is the main area where you can save a little bit, but again, you're not gonna save that much anymore. DDR4 prices have come down. You might not be able to get 32 gigabytes for 60 US dollars, but you might be able to get a 16 gigabyte RAM kit. And um, for, the, for the games we looked at in this video, that's perfectly fine. I was actually surprised how uh, little the games could take advantage of 32 gigabytes of RAM. The RAM utilization was sitting between six and eight gigabytes of RAM. So yeah, it seems like having 32 gig of RAM doesn't really make a huge difference for playing games. And finally, you have to be aware that this is an old platform. And the bottom line is the prices are just a little bit too high for what you're getting. Uh, that includes the main board and the CPU. The RAM is fairly well priced and with the quad channel bandwidth, we're getting decent performance, but the processor and the main board, they definitely have to be cheaper in order to be, uh, in order to be competitive with first gen Ryzen. You can go to AliExpress, get a B450 main board for $80 and an A320 main board brand new for around 60 or so. So that's cheaper what you have here. And with the CPU, you can get a Ryzen 1400 for around 60 and a 1600 for around 80 to 90 US dollars. And they will perform a lot better in many games because they have a higher clock speed. And yeah, that's really um, a good summary. Um, the value with the pricing is not really there. It's a fun project and I enjoy testing these parts and see what they can do. It was definitely a nice experience seeing uh, 24 threads in action in the task manager and in the uh, games. It, it certainly, yeah, it looks impressive, but the clock speed is really what's holding things back. If this was to run at a uh, four gigahertz or something like that, it would be amazing, but unfortunately it runs at only two gigahertz. And there you have it guys. So this was the Intel Xeon with 12 cores and 24 threads for 80 US dollars. I hope you found this video interesting. Do leave your comments down below. I always love hearing from you. And yeah, if you're on LGA 2011, share your experiences. What are you, what are you using? And what are your thoughts about first gen Ryzen instead of going for this platform? And if you found this video interesting, be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Give it a like, share the video with your friends and I shall see you soon with another one.